You must be intentional about everything that you think, everything that you allow in your mind, because one wrong thought in your mind sets off a chain reaction of events that will cause you to get offended and cause you to leave the church. Because once you allow a little bit of offense, it's very easy to allow more. welcome you to City Church to our Wednesday night experience. Get ready for some incredible worship. Get ready for a word from God. But more importantly, get ready to meet with your Creator tonight, to meet with Jesus, to meet with Holy Spirit, and be transformed, because that's what we do every time we meet with God. Amen? So let's worship together. I'm coming here, believe God's in this place right now. my 
please put that last slide up? So uh, everyone say the core. Um, there aren't many core meetings that are going to be this important. Um, if you're even slightly part of City Church, I encourage you to be there. Um, this is going to be a shifting meeting for City Church as a whole. Um, and so uh, it's on the 29th. Um, it is our desire for you to serve where God has gifted you. We haven't always done that real well in the past. We've asked you to serve. And how many of you know that we're all growing and we're all increasing in the kingdom of God, right? We're in pursuit of the kingdom. Tell someone say, I'm in pursuit of the kingdom. And so in pursuit of the kingdom, what you do is you discover from time to time that there are places that, that you need to grow and you need to shift and you need to change, right? All of us experience that. Say all of us. Point at me. Say him too. Absolutely. Um, it, here's the encouraging part. Or, or put on the negative side. If I'm done growing, if I feel like I've grown all I can and, and I'm all that I can be, then that means I can't function on a higher capacity than what I'm functioning right now. That means whatever I'm leading is limited by me and I become the lid over what it is that I'm doing. Are you with me? How many of you know that um, there is an overall decline, especially in the traditional churches in America? Now, that isn't true across the board as far as not every traditional church is declining. And just because a church is a, a non-traditional church or a little, similar, a little more similar to us doesn't mean they're growing. Here's what you find. If people stop growing, churches stop growing. And so what we have to do is we have to discover how we need to do church more like what Jesus intended for us to do church. Are you with me? We're not after one particular model. We're not after one particular way. We've, we've gone down that road before, and it's yielded some decent fruit. But um, how many of you know the better fruit is the fruit that Jesus designed for us to produce? I was with a bunch of pastors today, and we were praying. We were praying over this whole region. And, uh, you know, the, the pastor that opened up the meeting, uh, he, he spoke out of John 15 and about the fruit and, and about how that God wants us to have not only fruit, but he wants our fruit to be abundant. Say that, abundant fruit and lasting fruit. And, and the way that I think that happens is that you discover who you really are and you discover your giftings. See, because you, you, may, you may think you know what your giftings are. Uh, you may actually know what your giftings are, but how wonderful is it if it's all confirmed? Or you discover that there are things that, that God has put on the inside of you that you haven't tapped into yet. We're going to discover those things. We're not only going to discover the gifts that you've been walking in, we're going to discover the gifts that you will be walking in that God has in store for you. And I'm very excited about that as your pastor. Um, it, is, it is important to me to help you find the place to serve where you are gifted because that creates um, a sense of joy in serving. Some of you have just been serving and serving and serving and you've been giving of yourselves for years and years and years and, um, and, and you have just, you know, kept your chin down, kept your nose to the grindstone, I'm going to serve, I'm going to serve. But you know, if we would just sit down over a coffee, you'd probably say, hmm, you know, I, th this isn't my highest and best, I'm sure. It, it, it doesn't give me the joy, the, the sense of accomplishment that I really want to have. God intends for you to not only be successful, but to feel it. Are you with me? He wants you to be able to accomplish things, building the kingdom, where you step back and you look at it. Not like I build it, not like she builds it or he builds it, but the way God designed you to function, because you're important. You have gifting on the inside of you that is unlike anyone else on this planet. The gifts are similar, but the way you'll use it is going to be very different. It's different as the number of people that are on the earth. Make sense? So I want you to be there um, uh, because uh, it, it, I, I, I want us together to go through this transition. And, uh, and so I'm going to ask people to, um, you know, shift your schedules if you need to. Um, if, if you've got things planned, if you can adjust it, please do. If you can take some time off from work to be there on uh, Sunday the 29th, um, I'd ask you to do that. If you would go to the one slide before that, Rick. Uh, I'm sorry, I apologize on this slide. 
Um, it has the three colors of ministry. Um, and it has a price there of $25. And Crystal correctly said it was $15. And that is the price of that book at the bookstore. And you can grab that today for that price. But I want to make that correction. Okay? You feel corrected? Is that okay? Yeah. Is correction made? Yeah. Say that. Say correction made. Correction made. made and noted. Thank you very much. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, I ask you to come. I ask that you would be our teacher. That you would come and you would breathe on us. You would breathe in us. We right now, individually and collectively as City Church, we ask for your revelation. If you would, just just with your eyes closed, if you would, just lift your hands up to the Lord. If if you don't feel comfortable doing that, please, that's okay. Lord, we, we collectively lift our hands to you and we say, Holy Spirit, open our eyes. Open my spirit that I might receive from your spirit. In Jesus' name. And all the people of God said, Amen. Amen. I want to talk about the path of the believer tonight. Or said another way, um, the title of the message, message tonight is actually The Four Seasons of Spiritual Maturity. Now, let me caution you before we delve into these. Um, it, it requires a believer being intentional to go from one season of maturity to another. Unfortunately, too often, there is not the attention nor the intention given to one's own growth, and therefore, what we find are a lot of baby Christians. You say, well, why would you say that? Why, why would you say there's so many baby Christians? Well, I'll tell you why. Um, the church, the divorce rate in the church is just as high as the divorce rate out there. Actually, it's a few points lower. Um, I have to adjust it. It's just a, just a couple points lower. That's ridiculous. That should not be occurring. The amount of offense that is on the inside of of the church is is at a far too high. How in the world are we still getting offended? I'll tell you why. Because we haven't grown. We We haven't matured. We haven't become the people we're supposed to be. How is it that we haven't won the whole world yet? We have the Holy Spirit. And me and the Holy Spirit makes a majority. Are you with me? I mean, think about the power that's available to us that we can walk in. And we haven't won the world yet. And it tells me that, that why is that? Well, the devil can't stop us. Are you with me? And, and, and the heathen, I mean, they're, they're really looking for someone just to rise up and, and have a real gospel. Are you with me? So they're not going to stop us. God's for us. The angels are cheering for us. So what is it that could possibly be the problem? And it's us. Just touch someone and say, it's us. Say, we, we have to be honest enough with ourselves to say, Okay, there's a problem, and, and, and I are it. Are you with me? All right, and so um, if you will, if you have your Bibles with you, turn to Matthew chapter 3. I'm going to go down through Matthew 3. We were studying this last week, and I saw something in Matthew 3 that, that stunned me. I want to talk first uh, about, about Jesus and the seasons. Did you know Jesus had to go through seasons of maturity? That he had to be intentional. If Jesus himself would not have been intentional about growing, he would not have been able to accomplish the ultimate goal that he accomplished. Are you with me? Mm, Some of you don't believe that. See, we put Jesus in this category. It's like automatic. You know, how many of you have ever drove a stick shift? Let me see your hands. Really? That's all? Yeah? Drove a stick shift? Yeah? How many, how many now have an automatic, though? Your car is an automatic. You know, you put it in gear, and you just hit the gas, and you go, right? You don't have to be intentional about shifting gears. How many of you have thought about shifting gears recently? Unless you own a vehicle like mine, um, where you can actually manually shift, and it's a diesel, so when I go down, uh, there's, a, there's a hill that we go down just about every day called Layton Hill, between our place and, and the school, we have to pick up Caleb, it's a steep hill, so we actually gear the vehicle down. But for the most part, we don't even think about shifting gears anymore, right? Are you with me? And, and, and that's true of Christian walk. 
I mean, Christian, Christianity in America has become so autopilot-esque that we can just kind of cruise along and we can go through our whole lives without being intentional and never have grown past the first season of life and not even be aware of it. In Matthew 3, in verse 1 through 3, it says, In those days, John the Baptist, say John the Baptist. I love John the Baptist. He was just raw. I mean, he, he was just one of those kind. How many of you remember that, that, that comedian, Bobcat Goldthwaite? Like, isn't he the one that he screamed? He's like, ah! You know, I mean, everything he did, he screamed. I don't know why I loved it. I just loved to hear the man scream. Now, there are certain voices, pitches that kind of, I can't, like when my granddaughter screams, it's just like, it goes through me. It paralyzes me. I stop and kind of go like this, and my one eye closes a little bit, and I shift a little bit. You know what I'm talking about, right? Well, well, John the Baptist was raw like that. Say that. Say he was raw. And he came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. Say that with me. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight his paths. Now, in the first season of maturity, someone prepared the way for you. Come on, somebody. Uh, you know, it just really gets under my skin when I see believers who won't share the gospel with anyone. How do you think you got into the kingdom? How do you think you got there? Someone prepared the way. Say that. Someone prepared the way. Someone been praying for you. Come on, somebody. You, you hear what I'm saying? And, and, and it, really, it really blows me away that, that believers think that that can just sit back. Well, that, that's, I, I'm not an evangelist. No, you're not an evangelist. You don't belong on a stage. But that doesn't mean you can't share the gospel of Jesus Christ and what he has done for you. Listen, the gospel is not hard to share. It is good news. Come on, somebody. I'm not talking about turning on, you know, ABC, CBS, NBC, or, are you with me? It's good news. How hard is it to share good news? How many of you, when you go to a sale, so you, some of you all been buzzing about, oh, we've got to get to Kmart. There's a big sale going, oh, i got to get there. i got to get those deals. Come on, somebody. You're talking about that. Look, it's that easy to talk about the kingdom of God. Just share it. Share what God's done for you. Amen? Tell someone, say, just share what God's done for you, please. Look back at him and say, please, you share it too. So the first season of the believer's life is similar to the way we begin our natural lives. In the first season of our walk with God, we can't do anything for ourselves. We just can't. We need someone to do everything for us. The problem is we get caught in that mode and we think that's all there is to Christianity. Are you with me? Listen, someone prepared the way for you. Someone prayed for you. I guarantee you someone prayed you into the kingdom. You say, well, I don't know of anyone that prayed me into the kingdom. I guarantee you. So, look, God is not going to do anything on this earth without the involvement of his partners. That's his sons and daughters. Are you with me? And it's, it's his sons and daughters that he has given dominion over the earth. And so someone been praying for you. Listen, I remember when I was nine years old, crawling up the steps of the house that I live in now. Back then, it was my parents' house, and I was growing up in that house as a child. I was crawling up the steps, and I heard my mom up at the kitchen table like she did for many, many years before. And I used to love to crawl up to the top of those steps because the steps went up this way, then you had to go around through our kitchen, and then over here was the dining room. And she couldn't see from the dining room over where I was sitting on the steps. But I love to sit on top of those steps and hear her pray. She would have her Bible in front of her. She'd be leaning over like this and she'd be saying, Oh God, oh God, bless my sons. Oh God, bring them into your kingdom. Oh God, I know that you have something special for Brian. He, she would talk about Ross too, but I didn't want to hear about that. She would pray. She would say, Lord, I know you made him a great man of God. I know. And I, I remember, now that I think back, I remember her saying things like, you know, I know you made him to be a preacher. My God, someone prepared the way for you. Someone prayed for you. Matthew 3, 17, it says, and suddenly a voice came from heaven 
Say suddenly. Sometimes God just does things like, bam! You don't got time to react. You don't got time to think about it. You don't got time to make a decision. You don't got, a time, you don't got time to be scared. You don't got time to back out. It's just like, here I am. Deal with it. Suddenly, suddenly a voice came out of heaven. Jesus was thrown down into the waters by John. He, he went to John and said, John, baptize me. John said, no. I can't baptize you. You need to baptize me. Why would the lesser baptize the greater? And Jesus said, because it has to be so. Why? Because someone has to prepare the way for us. And John throws Jesus down into the waters and brings him out of the waters. And a voice booms out of heaven. It says, this is my son. This is my son whom I'm well pleased. He hadn't done anything yet. He hadn't done a miracle. He hadn't led anyone. He didn't multiply anything. How many of you know God's pleased with you long before you ever do anything? As a matter of fact, he's pleased before you ever start anything. He's pleased with you right now about the things you're going to do. How many of you know that in God, he loves you long before you ever thought you could be loved? Are you with me? And so Jesus had to hear the words, this is my beloved son. Why? Because Jesus, even Jesus had to be introduced to Jesus. He had to discover who he is. He had to be introduced to who he was, who God made him to be. Mm. Someone had to lead you. Someone had to baptize you in the water. Someone had to lead you to Holy Spirit so that you'd be filled with Holy Spirit. See, the first season is all about what others are doing for you. But unfortunately, the church in America has got stuck in that mode. What's the preacher like? What's he going to do for me? What's the worship like? What's he going to do for me? I'm not moved by that worship. Baby, I'm telling you, stop trying to be moved by the worship and you move the worship. Please don't tell me that you can't move worship from where you're sitting. If, if it's bad worship, then, then look in the mirror. Hmm. He being the mean pastor tonight. The second season. Some never make it this far. Some never move out of the take care of me season. The second season of the life of the believer, it's, it's like a young child who, who must learn to do things without someone, say that, without someone, doing it for them. It says in Matthew 4, 1, then Jesus was led up into the, by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. The church isn't going to keep you from darkness. I, your pastor, am not going to keep you from darkness. Your parents, your husband, your wife cannot keep you from the darkness in what you do. Holy Spirit himself cannot keep you from darkness in what you think. That's your job. God the Father... Nor Jesus, our Lord, cannot even keep you from the darkness in what you believe. That's your job. Moving from the first season to the second season is moving from the season of everything being done for you into the season of you learning. See, the second season draws on the previous season. In the first season of life, notice, Jesus was introduced to himself. He had to hear who he was. So in the first season of life, we're introduced to Jesus. In the first season of life, the Father gave you new life and called you son or daughter. In the first season of life, Holy Spirit came. We saw when Jesus came up out of the water, it says that Holy Spirit came in the form of a dove and sat on his shoulder. 
See, what you learn in one season will propel you into the next season. But if you don't learn to draw on what you learned in the previous season and use it in this season, you'll never be able to move forward. See, in these relationships, that's what gets you through the second season. Learning how to be in relationship with Jesus, the word. Having that intimacy with the word of God. Learning how to navigate through the word of God. Learning how to make the word of God from pages written to to words that come alive on the inside of you. Learning how to sit before the Father and allow him, uh, sit before Holy Spirit and allow Holy Spirit to reveal the, the Lord Jesus to you in the word of God. Learning to sit like my mom did with her Bible open. She would read and study the word of God and I would hear her say, Lord, open my eyes to your word. I pray that every morning. Father, open me to your word. I need your word. Open me body, soul, and spirit. My emotions, Lord, open. My eyesight, Lord, everything about me, my spirit, open me, Lord. And would you open your word to me? See, we have to approach the word with that kind of humility. Are you with me? The second relationship that we have to learn to flow in and walk in is a relationship with the Holy Spirit. He's the Lord of the spirit realm. He's the only God here on the earth. That's Holy Spirit. Learning how to press into Holy Spirit, learning how to lean into Holy Spirit. We talked about that today in the pastor's meeting. I said to them, I said, brothers, sisters, we have to learn in the season we're in how to lean into Holy Spirit. I'm talking to pastors. I'm talking to seasoned people in God. But let me tell you, I don't care how seasoned you are. You need to learn how to lean into God the season you're in. You need to learn how to lean in and, 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 and receive from Holy Spirit instruction and direction that he can break apart confusion and, and restore understanding and, and strategy and intelligence to your situation. Because when we just are walking through life and, and we wait until we get a problem, we wait until we, we hit the bump in the road and the car falls apart, it's too late. Now we've got to pick up the pieces. Now we've got to take the energy to fix everything. And, and we mistake things being fixed from our highest and best. Instead of waiting until the bump in the road comes, what if we would have leaned into Holy Spirit before we began the journey that day? And Holy Spirit says, oh, about mile post 7.9, there's going to be a hole. Don't hit it. And your car won't fall apart. And you get through the day and your car didn't fall apart and you're further ahead. If you would have hit that hole, you would have spent your whole day fixing. You would have missed work that day. Are you with me? Does this make sense? See, God's calling us to lean in. Say that. Lean into him. So we have relationship with Jesus, the word. We have relationship with Holy Spirit. And we have relationship with the Father. Man, this relationship is so important because it's all about you learning who you are. That he's our Father. There isn't anything he can't do. There isn't anything that he can't provide. There isn't anything that he hasn't already put in store for you. But you've got to learn who you are and that he's made all of that available to you right then, right now. You have to learn that all things work together for the good of those that love him and are called according to his purposes. Come on, somebody. I'm telling you, some of us still struggle with that one. That's only in the second season of life. We're still trying to get this relationship with Jesus, the Word, and Holy Spirit, and the Father. We're trying to learn who we are as sons and daughters. Listen, that's only in the second season. And I can encourage you, though, if you're in that season, you've gone further than most Christians because they're still stuck in the first season. They're still stuck in the give me season, do everything for me season. Are you with me? <laughs> Third season. Everyone say third season. See, in the second season of the believer's life, their relationship with the Lord is tested. Many never pass this test. They're going to be circulating back and forth between being in need and working out their relationship with the Lord. Being in need, working out their relationship with the Lord. What if they worked out their relationship with the Lord where the Lord was providing for their need before it ever became a need? 
What if he helped you to deal with your thought life? Oh, I don't want to go there. See, in the second season, trusting God is the greatest challenge. It, 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 look, it, there's so much more to this Christian walk. And if you're struggling with trusting God, you may be frustrated because, man, is this all the Christianity is? No, listen, there's so much more, but you've got to conquer trusting God in order to get to the third season. Are you with me? The third season is the test of the believer's life in their relationship, not with God, but in their relationship with other sons and daughters. If we look at Jesus' life, the next season, the next thing he did, he goes into the wilderness, he gets tested, right? Right? He goes and and is tempted. He has to lean into the Lord. The devil says, hey, you're so hungry. Take those stones and make them bread. This is in the second season. And Jesus said, not so. I don't need bread made out of stones. Every Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God is the bread of my life. The enemy says, Well, take yourself and cast yourself down. And and the word says that angels will care for you. He says, do not tempt the Lord your God or do not put the Lord your God to the test. You're going to have more than enough tests in life. You don't have to add any test to your life. Because when you test the Lord, what you're saying to God, I don't trust you. Prove yourself to me. God will say, okay. Because in order to walk with me, you've got to trust me. You can't walk with me if you don't trust me. You say, well, how am I supposed to trust the Lord if I don't trust the Lord? I mean, I'm just being honest. I don't trust the Lord. That's because you haven't been intimate with him. If you were intimate with him, you would know him. If you knew him, you knew you could trust him. Come on, somebody. Are you with me? Read 2 Peter. Matter of fact... I have a book called Living the Kingdom Life. It addresses that ad nauseum. So the third season is a test of the believer's life in the relationship with other sons and daughters. Look, navigating through disappointment and discouragement has to do with the third season of life. Now watch this. So Jesus starts gathering his disciples How many of you know his disciples were not completely done yet? Done, like, you know, eggs done on the stove or the cake being done or the bread being done. Are you with me? They weren't done yet. They were half-baked. Are you with me? Well, it's true. These guys were knuckleheads. See, the third season's all about learning how to deal with other sons and daughters of God. It's about navigating through the challenge of those that you're discipling. It's the disciples. Look, they're formed. I mean, he made them disciples, right? But they still were fighting. They were cussing. They don't believe. They got offended with each other. Can you imagine what Jesus' life was like? It was like herding cats. And the multitudes, forget about the multitudes. I mean, they were full of needs, criticism. They would turn on you on a dime. Think about it. In one week's time, they went from calling out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. You couldn't call anyone with a higher title than son of David. When Jesus was making his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, within one week, they're hanging him on the cross. Multitudes will turn on you. How will you navigate through those seasons? How will you navigate through people in your life? There aren't as many Christians that make it to the third season. But this third season is a real season of challenge. Learning how to deal with people, especially other believers, is a very difficult thing and requires amazing amount of intimacy with the Lord and an amazing amount of maturity. You must be intentional about this season of life. You must be intentional about everything that you think, everything that you allow in your mind, because one wrong thought in your mind sets off a chain reaction of events that will cause you to get offended and cause you to leave the church. I've seen it happen too many times. I've seen people that were the greatest shouters, the greatest praisers, they were the greatest workers, and I'm telling you, a little bit of offense 
because one thought was allowed in their minds and the enemy a do- caused a domino effect, a snowball, if you will, rolling down a mountain to the place. Because once you allow a little bit of offense, it's very easy to allow more. The third season, learning to deal with others that call themselves sons and daughters. It's the third season. The fourth season, you've learned not to be needy. You've learned to get your needs met by God. You've sealed your relationship with Holy Spirit, with the Father, with Lord Jesus. You've learned how to navigate in your relationships with others. But see, this fourth season It's a tough season. Very few believers ever make it to the fourth season. See, in this fourth season, it all comes together. God provides, always. He loves you. You've learned to love others. In the second season, you really learn how to, the second season really is about trusting God, but it's learning how to love God. The third season is learning how to love people. This fourth season, it's for the most mature believers, it's the hardest. It's learning how to correctly love you. That's the hard part. See, because too often we get our view of who we are through the wrong methods. Caleb and I have been talking about, you know, middle school is brutal. No, no, like, I can't believe some of the stuff that goes on. Those kids are brutal. They will tear you up, call you a friend, and then shred you. My heart grieves. I'm just like cheering Caleb on. Come on, son. You can make it through middle school. I know you can. But if we make it through this season, we become world changers. See, it's here that Jesus' greatest work of ministry, apart from the crucifixion, takes place. It's here that he lays out the declaration of freedom from the world and the constitution of the kingdom of God in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. In each of these seasons, and at various times in each season, we have to be very careful and very intentional. We can begin to unnoticeably slide into the place of God taking a back seat We can skid into the place of our problems becoming large. We can fall into the place of hope being lost, feeling tired of the journey, disappointment, discouragement setting in. If we're not intentional, if we're not cautious, not fearful, not filled with worry, but intentional. Intentional about maintaining my walk with God. That he is my everything. He is my all in all. He is my beginning and my end. That everything I am comes out of him, through him, from him. My identity comes from him. My relationships are blessed by him. The work of my hands is seeded by him. He gives me the seeds of what I'm to do so that my life produces abundant fruit and lasting fruit. See, no matter what season of life you're in, you can find yourself in a place where God is no longer your everything. You didn't mean it. You didn't intend it. But here you are. 
Problems are large. Disappointment has gripped you. Hope is lost. The journey is getting tiring. Had more than enough, God. You find yourself backing away. You find yourself separating. You find yourself getting cold on the inside. There's no passion for the word. There's no passion for the things of God. There's no passion for the church. There's no passion for your relationships. It's just coldness, emptiness, aloneness. Here's the promise. The promise is, he said, no matter what you do, I will never, I will never leave you. When you're not intentional, I still won't leave you. When you're not cautious, I will stay right by you. And all I need you to do, all I need you to do is just turn to me. I'm right here. I am right now. We don't have to go back. We don't have to rebuild the bridges. We don't have to retrace the steps. You have to do just one thing. Just turn. Just turn to me. Allow me to put my arms around you. Allow me to connect my heart with yours and allow the love of my heart to pump on the inside, rejuvenating you with life, rejuvenating you with my love, rejuvenating you with every good thing, rejuvenating you with hope and purpose and protection and every good thing that you need. You see, because that's who I am to you, no matter what season. If you're old in the Lord or young in the Lord, every one of us must be intentional about maintaining this relationship with the Lord. It was last week sometime that I realized I was getting cold on the inside. Hope was slipping away. It's just a matter of my perspective. Maybe you didn't feel that. Maybe you did. The truth is, only God has the right perspective. Only He has the truth. And I can promise you, when hope starts to slip away, when that coldness starts to, to ice our hearts, everything looks worse. Even the best things look dark because there's this shade, this cloud. You remember, remember the cartoon Peanuts? Remember the guy that just walked around and just had that dirt cloud around him? Pig pen, yeah. That's, that's what, when you start down that path, when, you, when, 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 you just, when, you, when you're not intentional, when you're not cautious, when, when you're not careful in your relationship with your Lord and you just allow problems to loom large. You just allow your focus to come off of the Lord and, and you get your eyes on your situation and your problem. And listen, God wants you to see those things. God is not unaware. He doesn't want you to be unaware. He doesn't want you to, to walk around like a blithering idiot where, oh, God's good and everything's falling apart around you. That's not God. That's not reality. What he wants, though, is not those things to be your focus. He wants you to be aware of them, but they're to be your peripheral vision. I watched Chelsea tonight. It was beautiful what she did. She's up, taking up the offering, and Miriam is underneath her and poking at the mic, at the mic and, and, just, and just having a good old time, and Chelsea's not even the slightest bit shaken. Me, I'm like, huh, huh, huh. And Chelsea's like, hmm. She never took her focus off what she was doing. Are you with me? Yeah. Now, my focus was off. Are you with me? I just, I, I, that's a mom. Thank God for moms. Are you with me? But, but listen, but she just, see, she used her peripheral vision. That's how we need to be. We need to stay focused on the Lord. Are you with me? Stand up. We need to close. Two things I want to leave you with tonight. Say two things. 
Two things. How many want to leave with two things? Bang your hands together. You don't want to leave with two things? Did you clap? Yes. My daughter. You can clap now. <laughs> All right. There's two things I want you to leave with. Being intentional about growing from season to season. You say, well, how do you go from season to season like that? Listen, we have so much here for you to help you with that. We have everything from 20-minute talks that teach you how to think about the kingdom to the foundations classes to cell groups to sozos, on and on and on. We have so much that can help you do that. But you've got to be intentional about those things. I mean, listen, we, we didn't do constant devotion to get rich. You with me? I don't do that because I just get like really excited on the inside. Ooh, someone bought a constant devotional. Woohoo! We produce this stuff to put tools in your hands so you can be intentional. Because I'm not going to stand before the Lord and the Lord say to me, you didn't do your job. They were hungry, they were starving, and you didn't feed them. Look, I'm going to put a brand banquet table out. I can't make you eat it. That's up to you. But I just think it's criminal that someone's standing, nothing but bones, saying, I'm hungry. And there's this bountiful table in front of them. Not on my watch. Come on, somebody. Hopefully not on yours. You with me? So listen, two things I want you to leave here today with. Number one, be intentional about your walk with God. Go from season to season. It takes time. It takes maturing. It's not easy. It will cost everything, but you'll get more than anything you've ever given multiple times over in return from the Lord. Number two, be intentional about maintaining your walk with the Lord. First and foremost, maintaining your intimacy with the Lord. You maintain that, everything else falls into place. I promise you. I've been doing this for more than a couple months. I know what I'm talking about. If I don't maintain my, my if, if I'm not intentional about my intimacy with the Lord, after a couple days, you're going to know it. After about a day or so, the devil's going to know it. I don't want that. The problem is when I don't maintain that intimacy, intimacy with the Lord, there are things that I could have avoided that I didn't. Are you with me? So, be intentional about going from season to season. Maintain your intimacy, your relationship with the Lord. Are you with me? All right? Can I pray for you right now that you're able to be intentional about those things. Lift up your hands to the Lord. So, Father, right now, I pray for every man, woman, and child in this room. There are great, great people in this room that are going to be growing and maturing and going from season to season, and I'm so excited about that. And on top of that, Lord, they're going to continually be intentional about their relationship with you, and you're excited about that. So, Father, I bless them now. In Jesus' mighty name. Like you're ready to pay Got your eyes out of socket Like you're a mile away Mouth shut like a locket Like you're nothing to say Speak your mind up, come on baby, free yourself